So the plan today is that we will uh, continue with our discussion of muon G minus two using the large mass expansion or method of regions. And we are focusing on three diagrams from the standard model electroweak contributions, namely with W exchange, Z exchange or Higgs exchange. And all these three diagrams are examples where we have a hierarchy of scales, a heavy scale given by the weakly interacting particles and a light scale given by the muon and its momentum. And uh, one question that we particularly focus on is which logarithms appear in the result. Are some results enhanced by large logarithms of the mass ratio between the two scales, which is a significant enhancement? Uh, or is there not such an enhancement? And the last time we already uh, went to the soft region, the discussion of the soft region in the method of regions, and we applied it to the Higgs case, and there we discovered a large logarithm. And we also discovered something very interesting which we should keep an eye on, namely divergences. In the original diagram, there are no divergences, neither ultraviolet nor infrared divergences. However, once we apply method of regions, we divide our integral into two, hard plus soft, and each one is somehow incorrect in some region of momentum space and therefore in the soft region we suddenly get ultraviolet divergences. In the hard region we will see what we get, but somehow the divergences must drop out between themselves in order for the full result to be finite again. But uh, the nice thing is that the divergences are associated with logarithms and then the divergences give us a simple way to understand which logs appear in the result and the logs then can be a physical part of the physical answer while the divergences drop out. Very interesting connections. And um, to begin, we could now continue with the soft region and that's what I would propose. Let us continue with the soft region and I gave you uh, the result for the numerator for the Z boson diagram. And we calculated here explicitly the integrals which we need for the soft region and therefore we could plug in the results of uh, the soft calculation into the diagram for the Z. And then we will obtain the full result for the Z boson soft part. And maybe you can do that now yourself and I will walk around and uh, check to what extent you are able to do it. But uh, please try it for yourself. I think you have all the results necessary and you just have to plug in the different building blocks. So here, this is the starting integral and this is still not approximated, but now you can apply the method of regions to it. And then the denominator changes, the denominator becomes um, an approximation where the term with one over k square minus the heavy mass is Taylor expanded and becomes just one over the heavy mass. And then the result of the integrals are already known. We can plug the results in directly without any other calculation. So this should be what you basically are, are working with. So I have 
done what I explained to you also. Namely, we replace these integrals by the known results. For example, k mu k slash is replaced by p plus p prime mu with appropriate prefactor, and then here the two can be factored out. It cancels. We get two minus d times m times p plus p prime mu, and so on for the other terms. So. Let us now come slowly to the conclusion. The task was to calculate it and to answer what are the divergences, what are the logarithms. And so if we simply work out all the prefactors, then you see, I mean, there is nothing uh, to do except every term contains the structure P plus P prime mu, so we can factor that out. Every term contains a factor M, we can factor it out. So all that remains is to sum up two minus D plus four minus two, uh, and here minus eight plus two d. And what is the result of this summation? Who has it? I over 16 pi square. So beam u. So all of this can be factored out, and then the remaining term is what? Did you have it? Yes. I agree. Okay, so if you sum it up, then uh, for d equal to four, you get zero. And therefore, only the epsilon terms remain. And uh, if you work out the prefactors, then this is what remains. And then we can now take the limit epsilon going to zero. What happens in the limit epsilon going to zero? Yes, so that contains one over epsilon, uh, which is an ultraviolet divergence, similar to the case of Monday. But this ultraviolet divergence now cancels by being multiplied with this epsilon. So from the one over epsilon times epsilon, we get one. And all the complicated finite parts in the B0, they go to zero, they vanish. Therefore, uh, epsilon times B0 gives just one, and then what remains is the following, i over 16 pi square times m p plus p prime mu divided by minus m z square. So this has all canceled, and then we have two c v square plus two c a square minus four c a square, so overall, 2CV square minus 2CA square. Okay, and that can be compared to the case of the Higgs. So now you should, uh, if you did it, be very satisfied by this surprising and interesting result, which deviates qualitatively from the case with the Higgs. In principle, just by looking at the diagrams, we do not expect something radically different, but in the Higgs case, we did have an ultraviolet divergence and we discussed about its role. And here, the ultraviolet divergence is actually zero. And uh, we have stressed many times that the ultraviolet divergence goes along with a logarithm, which has physical implications. Here, there is no divergence, therefore there is no logarithm, and therefore no physical implications of a log. 
So that has a very important consequence of the physical result for G minus two from the diagram with the Z boson exchange. Very important difference. So, so this is power counting divergent. By this I mean that just by looking at the powers of k in the numerator and denominator, you would expect that there is a divergence. But I mean, sometimes uh, the divergences can accidentally add up to zero, and that is the case here. The UV divergence cancels. And for this reason, there is no ln mu square over the muon mass square um, present in the result. Very important uh, physical consequence. Yeah, but it's actually uh, not the same coupling constant structure and therefore the argument doesn't work for the W boson. Because you see that it is really a detailed combination of the exact prefactors. And so you do not know a priori that these prefactors are exactly the same in the W case. No. They also differ because the photon couples differently. The photon couples to the W boson instead of to the muon. So therefore the structure of gamma matrices in the diagram is really distinct. Oh, and that okay. gives rise to a different numerator structure. Yeah. Yes. So indeed. Um, but having uh, discussed this, do you have questions to the Z? Uh, if not, I would say we do it for the W now. Now, next. Any questions to the Z? So, fundamental result is for the soft part, Higgs behaves accidentally different from the Z. In one case we have a lock, in the other case we have no lock. Very interesting. And let us now look at the W boson. And here the diagram has a different shape, namely this one. And here we have not a muon, but we have a neutrino. And here we have the heavy W boson, which couples to the photon, because the W boson has electric charge. And I told you, we only want to know whether there is a logarithm like this in the result. And now you hopefully understand what we need to do in order to just uh, check the existence or non-existence of the log. Namely, we apply the method of regions, but without uh, detailed calculations, and hope that just by looking at the structure, we already discover something. So let us carry out together the method of regions for this diagram, or equivalently, large mass expansion. So we again have hard plus soft. And uh, yeah. let us look at both contributions. Starting maybe with soft. Let's work out together what happens if we do the soft part of the loop here with a W boson. Yes. from these two propagators. So to go one step back, um, just to explain the basics, uh, where did you uh, arrive at this result? So you have three propagators, and then what do you do with the three? So you have two propagators, and two of the propagators have um, mass, W mass. Mm -hmm. so Yes. And then pulling out these two masses squared from the 
-hmm. Right. And what happens with the neutrino propagator in the soft approximation? It's just massive. Nothing. Yeah, so we do nothing to it. It remains what it is. So then in the soft region, um, this diagram becomes, so basically, let's write it in this large mass expansion way. We have a Taylor expansion just of the W boson part. This is now Taylor expanded, and it becomes what you say, one over the W mass to the fourth power. Uh, and the higher orders may be some uh, polynomial in the momenta as well. And then this gives an effective field theory vertex. This effective field theory vertex is inserted into the full diagram, and then the full diagram looks like that. So here the blob is the Taylor expanded version of this, and then we have a Feynman diagram where this one over mass is inserted there, and otherwise we have a loop with a neutrino line and uh, two external muons and one external photon. And now uh, we would need to understand what is the ultraviolet divergence of this diagram and what is the logarithm of this diagram and so on. And do you have any ideas? It works because, as we know, the divergences must cancel. So, and if we see that here we have one over m w to the fourth, it means the one over m w square term has no divergence. Therefore, it has no log, and therefore, in the hard part, it must also have no log. And then that is the answer. Yep. So, I wonder, is this exact probably to have a stateless integral? Also, I wanted to dwell on that too. The integral has no dimensionful uh, physical parameter in it because the neutrino mass vanishes and there is no external momentum flowing into that loop. So this loop integral is literally what we call an A0 function of zero if the neutrino mass is zero and that vanishes. It is a scaleless integral. So for both reasons, uh, we get zero here. So. At the m, 1 over m square, uh, we have literally zero, but at the 1 over m to the fourth power, we also have zero, and therefore we have no log. And your, your argument with a scaleless integral applies actually to even higher powers, regardless how far we do the expansion, 1 over m to the six or to the n, it will always be a scaleless integral just by looking at the diagram, therefore at no order there is a logarithm. So we see that in the W boson diagram there is also no logarithm, but for a reason which is simpler to understand than in the case of the Z. In the Z case it looks like an accident, in the W case it looks a little bit more systematic and fundamental. But that is the answer to this exercise. And you see that here, uh, that is really a case where the method of regions gives you a huge calculational advantage because otherwise you would have to do the calculation in order to see this result. And here it is really simple. And for the hard part, something similar It must automatically hold, uh, otherwise the method would be inconsistent. And of course I claimed the method is consistent. So if you take that for granted, it must work out like this. So. And now, of course, we will do the hard part calculation. Okay, we will now do it for the Higgs and for the Z, but not for the W. But uh, here the task was simply to use the method and uh, get the result. We have done it. But let us now do the full calculation for the other diagrams, all right? So, ready? So let me begin, maybe.
let us do the method of regions and the hard part and apply it ultimately to the Higgs and Z diagrams. So what we have is uh, diagrams with this generic shape, a heavy line and a light muon, the photon couples to the light muon. And in the hard region, our mo loop momentum is large. And uh, therefore, what we need to tailor expand is really the entire diagram tailor expanded with respect to its external momentum. So we can write it like this, tailor expansion of the full diagram with respect to P, P prime, and the muon mass. And this tailor expansion is simply applied to the entire diagram. And then the result is going to be a polynomial in these variables, so it will look like a local Feynman rule in the EFT. The entire diagram is replaced by a local Feynman rule. So technically, this is now a little bit more laborious than the other case. So uh, in the diagram, what we need to approximate is since the loop momentum is large, we, um, we have these light propagators uh, which look like this, 1 over k square plus 2 kp. Um, in the simplified version, because p square is equal to m square, they are now approximated, k is big and p is small, therefore we have something large plus a small correction and we do a geometric series uh, for this case. So we write it as 1 over k square times a geometric series, 1 minus 2 kp divided by k square plus higher orders, let's say 4 kp square divided by k to the 4 and so on. Up to what order do we maybe need to expand? Probably. What do you think? Is it sufficient to have this term or do we need this term or do we need even higher order terms comparing with a soft result? So the interesting non-vanishing term here, if you look at it, what it is comparable to? But here, looking at the second to last line, um, I see actually m times p plus p prime. m and p are of the same order. So the result, which is non-vanishing, contains two powers of the light scale in the numerator. Therefore, uh, it is likely that we need the p square term. It is of the same order as this. So let's keep this in mind. So this is the approximation for one denominator. And uh, here in the diagram, we have actually two such factors, k square plus 2kp times k square plus 2kp prime. And we need to expand the product. And this is then 1 over k to the 4 times uh, this thing and the same for p prime and all multiplied. So multiplying immediately gives 1 minus 2kp plus p prime divided by k square. So I combine the term with p and p prime and that gives me a sum. And then here we have a term 4kp square similarly 4k p prime square from the other factor and then we have also a product term this times the counterpart with p prime 4k p times k p prime and all divided by k to the 4 and then we have all the terms up to order p square So therefore, this is our um, approximation by definition of the hard region. And now let us again calculate our three integrals which actually appear in the Feynman diagrams. So again, I call it I general 
part. These are these integrals in the numerator. We have either k mu k slash or simply k mu or one. In the denominator, we have now the approximated denominator. The approximated denominator is this thing here, one over k to the four. And uh, then the other propagator is unchanged, k square minus a heavy mass square. And then we have the square bracket uh, as a correction, uh, one minus two k p plus p prime divided by k square plus one over k to the four, four times k p square plus k p prime square plus k p k p prime. Okay, this is the integral. And now it looks a little bit laborious because we have here simply a lot of terms which uh, correspond to loop integrals that we would have to compute. That is unfortunate, but we can do it. Do you immediately see some ideas how you could simplify the calculation? Is there maybe something that we can immediately neglect, throw away or so for some reason? Yeah? I think we can neglect the denominator being k squared over k minus n squared because that would give something which is the divergence. If we are only interested in the divergence, then um, we might uh, think of something like this, but we are now interested really in everything. Of course, in the divergence also to check the cancellation, but we want the full result. We want the full result. And by the way, um, one over k to the four, k to the six is ultraviolet finite, but infrared divergent. Now we have to deal with infrared divergence at k going to zero. Here, something like this is dangerous at k going to zero, and that will give rise to additional divergences, which will cancel the divergences from before. Looking at it, probably all integrals that we see here, almost all of them are ultraviolet finite, but most of them are infrared divergent. Yes? For example, since we don't have combination like k plus p, mm -hmm. we can Yes, the odd terms in k can be neglected. So for example, k mu times one can be neglected. That is important. So half of the terms drop out. k mu times one is zero. k mu times that is also zero. So for the k mu, only this part in the square bracket contributes. That is a simplification. So let's write that down, odd terms. Uh, let's neglect them immediately. And then there is a second simplification which we have already used in uh, our calculations some weeks ago. So suppose you have something like this. We had a similar construction already. One over k square to some power times k square minus m square. This already appeared in other calc. What is going on? Uh, sorry. Uh, what happens to this? What is the trick that you would use? Partial, Partial fractioning. We have done it, and after doing it, what happens to the k-square? Scaleless ultrafractioning. Yes, some terms vanish, but by the partial fractioning, you also get a prefactor, one over m-square. And lo and behold, we already saw that effectively, that just becomes m-square. So this is equal to this m-square to the power of n, k-square minus m-square. And all the other terms that would arise are scaleless and vanish. 
So that is a simple rule. And that means that we can immediately calculate most of these integrals with k to the 4, k to the 6, k to the 8, even in the denominator. They are all uh, given by this. Very simple. Then another note. So if you have an integral, k mu, k nu, times some function of k square only, that is the case here in many cases, so the denominator depends only on k square, not on k mu plus p mu or so. Um, and then in the numerator we have this. Then the result can only be proportional to which uh, Lorentz structure? G mu nu. But if it is only proportional to G mu nu, then we can make an ansatz like Passarino Feldman ansatz g mu times some factor, and the factor is determined by contracting with g mu once again, and then we see that this is the same as saying g mu nu divided by the dimension d times k square times f of k square. And you can check it by contracting both sides with g mu nu. Then you have here k square, and here also k square is the same. So k mu, k nu, whenever it appears, can be replaced by g mu nu over d times k square. Basically an average, if you want. Okay? So that solves also half of the integrals. But then there are now some integrals with four k's in the numerator. k mu, k nu, k rho, k sigma, times some function of k square. And here the idea is the same as here, but just the uh, result is more complicated. What do you think, what could be the Lorentz structure that comes out of such an integral? Yes, and uh, is it, should it be plus or minus, given the symmetry of the original integral? Is it symmetric or anti-symmetric in the indices? Symmetric. It is symmetric, completely symmetric, and that is why we have here a plus. And then we again contract with uh, something like g mu g rho sigma on both sides of the equation, and then we see that we get a denominator d square plus 2d times k to the 4 f of k square. So basically the rule is if you have four powers of k, replace them by this combination of g's divided by d square plus 2d and replace k by k to the 4. And then we have a recipe for all diagrams. Let me clean the blackboard, but maybe you can go on and uh, you can maybe start calculating the diagram with k mu. Do it. Just take the k mu here, then from the square bracket only this can contribute and then using all the rules you can get the result and then we do the rest um, together. Which term in the square bracket contributes again? So let's write it down, the contributing term, which was it? Yep. 2k times p plus p prime. Minus. Okay, then we have an integral of this type. And uh, is there anything else to do? So what is the result in your opinion? Minus 2 g mu over d uh, times k squared divided by k to the 6, so k to the 4. Mm -hmm. And then you look, yeah. And just the p plus p prime with the open index mu on the bottom. Okay. Yep. 
minus 2 g mu mu divided by d a0 of m divided by m to the fourth. Very good. I would say P plus P prime. Oh. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Very good. I agree. And the other two results. Anybody, some other result? Let's put it here, maybe. So, which one should we, should we begin with? With the one or with the one? Okay. One times the square bracket. Then only the even terms. One plus four divided by k to the fourth times kp square plus kp prime square plus K P K P prime. So these are two different and independent terms, two independent terms, and we can of course first calculate the first one with the one. What is the result for this? Divided by what? M to the sixth mm -hmm. times A zero of M. Um, could there be something like a dimensionality D from ah, this denominator? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now uh, regarding orders, which orders are relevant for us? So this is overall one over M square, because that is M square divided by M to the fourth and that would be one over m to the fourth. So therefore, this is really negligible for us. But this term is important, so we could actually drop this term. Good. And uh, then the remaining one, k mu k slash, again times the same square bracket, and here we cannot neglect this. So let's calculate the term with the one. What is the result for the term with the one? The term with the one simply gives us uh, k mu k nu is replaced by g mu nu. Then k mu k slash is replaced by what? G mu nu over d, and what happens with a slash? A gamma, gamma. Times gamma nu. So the result is proportional to gamma mu divided by d. What does this tell you? This is probably zero regarding, this is not important regarding. G minus two. So it doesn't contribute. We can neglect it. The prefactor is a number, it's a numerical prefactor, it doesn't contain gamma structures, and then according to our discussion, this does not contribute to g minus two. And that would be dimensionless. Uh, I mentioned this on Monday. So in the hard part, there are in principle terms which are of the order 
mass to the zero. This is such a term, but actually it doesn't contribute to g minus two. Let us now calculate the term with a complicated part in the square bracket that will contribute to g minus two and it will be mass suppressed. So that is now the most complicated part of the thing, but not very complicated. But we have four powers of k, k mu, k slash, and then here k rho, k sigma times some piece. That is simply what we need. And okay, I can give you the result or at least some next step. So the integral that you get is four divided by d square plus two d. So the four comes from here and the d square plus two d comes from this denominator. And now uh, then we have an integral um, k to the four divided by k to the four times k to the four k square minus m square. Okay, so this comes from the fact that all the four powers of k are now replaced by k to the four. This k to the four comes from this denominator here and the other k to the four is the denominator that we had initially. So then the additional k to the four cancel between themselves, but uh, the initial uh, prop uh, denominator structure remains. And then we have to deal with the g mu nu term. G mu nu, one index nu is uh, contracted with gamma nu, and the other indices rho sigma, they are contracted with p or p prime. So then let's work it out. So the first term gives us gamma mu times g rho sigma, and that gives us p square plus p prime square plus p p prime from the three terms here. The second term gives us gamma sigma, gamma sigma, because gamma nu is contracted with g nu sigma, so we get plus gamma sigma, and then uh, let's say um, rho is connected with mu and nu with sigma. So let's work it out immediately. So here we have p rho, p sigma. That gives us then p slash times p mu. In the second term, we get p prime slash times p prime mu. And in the third term, we get plus p slash times p prime mu. And then the third term in the numerator is the same, but the role of p and p prime is reversed. So here we have p prime slash times p prime mu plus p slash p mu plus p prime slash p mu without prime. So this ends the numerator. Okay, then the gamma mu term cancels again. So this is negligible because it's gamma mu times a numerical prefactor, which doesn't contribute to g minus two. And here all the slashes are replaced by m. p slash is m, p prime slash is also m. So we have m times p mu, m times p prime mu, m times p prime mu, m times p prime mu, m times p mu, m times p mu. So overall we always get m times either p or p prime. How many times? Three times. So m times three times p plus m times three times p prime gives overall three m p plus p prime mu. So overall we then have 12 m p plus p prime mu divided by d square plus two d. And then here this becomes a zero of m divided by m to the fourth. 
And uh, okay, I always omitted now recently this i over 16 pi square. But that is the result. So then we have all the three integrals. In the end, the results of the three integrals are actually quite simple, even though the initial expressions were not. But the KMU integrals becomes just this. The uh, complicated integral becomes just this simple formula. And the integral with 1 becomes uh, just that. So the results are not very complicated. And this is what we can now insert. And then the rest is similar to the soft part. So let us do it. So the result for the Higgs So the hard integral for the Higgs boson diagram is, I repeat all the prefactors, y square eq times 2k slash times k mu plus 4m times k mu divided by k to the 4 k square minus m Higgs square times this complicated square bracket. This square bracket here appears there. And uh, now we see that for the Higgs, we need two of those integrals. Namely, we need the one with k mu k slash, which has this result. And we need the one with k mu, which has that result. And we add the two up with the appropriate prefactors. And let me give the results. So the result is y square eq times m p plus p prime mu i divided by 16 pi square times a0 of m higgs divided by m higgs to the fourth. And then we have from uh, th this integral with the 12, we have 24 divided by d square plus 2d. Okay, that comes from this 2 times k slash k mu. 24 divided by the denominator. And from the other term, we have 2 to over d times 4 gives minus 8 over d. That's the result. Everything else is the same common prefactor of both contributions. So therefore, the uh, thing that we need to work out is simply the round bracket here, which depends on numbers, in particular on d. Now. What is the result of the round bracket if you put d equal to 4? Yes. 24 divided by 16 plus 8 is 1. Uh, minus 2. Um, OK. That doesn't look good. Wait a minute, shouldn't that be zero? Uh, of course not, because we are at the Higgs. Uh, thanks. Um, so that is, of course, the Higgs, where there is a divergence. And therefore, uh, we get a divergence here as well. So we get uh, 1 minus 2 gives minus 1. So the overall divergence, we already know it, is minus 1 times the divergence of the A0 function, which is essentially 1 over epsilon times the mass prefactors. And that has the chance of canceling the plus 1 over epsilon divergence from the soft part, which is what you wanted, if you remember, or you, one of you wanted it. And this is uh, exactly happening. So let us write down a discussion corresponding to this. So we have a divergence. And this divergence is actually what is called an infrared or IR divergence. 
resulting from the 1 over k to the 4 at k going to 0, which is also divergent. And remember, the origin of this is that we started with a finite integral and applying method of regions changes, in this case, changes the integrand at small k, makes the integrand incorrect and therefore worsens the infrared behavior at small k, introducing a divergence. And this divergence cancels the ultraviolet divergence from uh, the soft part. So the integrand changed at k going to zero. And by the way, note, this integral here, one over k to the four, simply, what is this integral? It would on the one hand be a B0 function, B0 function with all arguments being zero, momentum argument zero and mass argument zero. And we said that this B0 function has an ultraviolet divergence of one over epsilon. But on the other hand, what do you know about this integral? It is scalars and therefore zero. And therefore this integral, setting this integral zero, implements a cancellation between infrared and ultraviolet divergences. Because it is ultraviolet divergent and also infrared divergent and also zero. So this is really uh, encapsulating this uh, relationship between infrared and ultraviolet divergence. So it's on the one hand zero, but on the other hand also it is given by i over 16 pi square times one over epsilon from uv minus one over epsilon from infrared divergences. And uh, this explains that actually one over epsilon in dimensional regularization can in principle correspond to ultraviolet or infrared divergences. And in general, you do not know. You need to do a dedicated analysis in order to know whether one over epsilon corresponds to UV or IR. And in this case, you see that you can trade one for the other by adding zero in terms of this integral. You can uh, change uh, one over epsilon uv to one over epsilon ir, and the two can cancel. And in general, there is only one epsilon in dimensional regularization which regularizes both necessarily simultaneously, otherwise there would be no way to set such integrals to zero. So uh, this is important to know um, in order to understand why uv divergences can cancel ir divergences. So, but this is what is happening here. And now we can also discuss, of course, the logarithm. In the hard part, there is a logarithm and a non-analytic behavior in the Higgs mass dependence. And uh, clearly the one over epsilon pole is associated with ln mu square, and the ln mu square is automatically accompanied by ln m Higgs square, and the coefficient is the same as the one of one over epsilon. So we know immediately that the result is proportional to one over epsilon plus ln mu square divided by m Higgs square. And therefore, the divergences cancel and physical ln m Higgs square over m square remains in the full result. But we will discuss this in more detail um, later on when I summarize everything. I hope we have enough time. Then, what is the result? So the i hat for the z is given by this CV square plus CA square times the following 12 divided by D square plus 2D M P plus P prime mu times 4 minus 2D, that is the first term. 
where the prefactor here comes from our calculation that we just did. This prefactor comes from the result in the set boson diagram. Then the next is plus eight over D times two M P plus P prime mu. Next minus eight over D M times P plus P prime mu. And all of that is so bracket closes here and then this is multiplied with an integral one over k to the four times k square minus mz square. So this would need to be calculated and the result is of course again an a zero function times all these prefactors and then plus the c a square term times minus 8m p plus p prime mu plus 8m p plus p prime mu, plugging in the result. So I literally plugged in the result, um, but what you see now is actually at this uh, sum vanishes uh, because the prefactors add up to zero. So this is multiplied with some loop integral, but uh, it vanishes. Therefore, what remains is only the term with CV square plus CA square, whereas in the soft part uh, we got in the end CV square minus CA square, but here we get CV square plus CA square, which can happen. So then the result in total is CV square plus CA square times M P plus P prime mu divided by mz to the fourth power times i divided by 16 pi square times a zero of mz times the following, namely 24 times two minus d divided by d square plus two d plus eight times d plus two divided by d times d plus two. And now I can ask you again, what is the round bracket for d equal to four? We have 24 over 24 times minus two, gives minus two, and here eight over d plus two. Minus two plus two is zero. So that means this is again proportional to epsilon and the divergence cancels, as we have predicted from the soft part, and as it has to be. But it's nevertheless very nice to see it. So this thing here, if you work it out, is four epsilon over three plus order epsilon square. And then we simply use A zero um, times four epsilon over three in the limit epsilon going to zero is simply four over three mz square and the divergence has cancelled. So, now I would like to use the remaining time to summarize the results and give some further comments on them. So, let us begin with the Higgs. Here we have this Feynman diagram again. Muon uh, couples to a photon via Higgs exchange. And using the method of regions, we obtained this structure. Namely, the soft part means that we uh, get a new vertex from contracting the heavy line to a point and then plugging the result as an effective vertex into an EFT Feynman diagram with only light lines in the loop. And the hard part corresponds to a simple Taylor expansion of the entire diagram with respect to the small uh, physical scales of the problem, giving rise to one explicit EFT Feynman rule. 
So when we now calculate a mu from it, then we get a mu from the soft part. We already constructed it by getting all the prefactors, so the minus eq is replaced by 2m uh, for the form factor, and q square is set to zero. Then we get here y square m square divided by 8 pi square times the Higgs mass square times b0 of 0 mm. That is the exact result of the soft part, including the ultraviolet divergence. And the b0 function with these simple arguments can be easily written down in full glory. y square m square divided by 8 pi square m higgs square times 1 over epsilon plus ln mu square divided by small m square. That is the exact result, as simple as that. We had that already. Uh, but let's say again, so here we have a UV divergence which arises because the soft integral has changed at a large momenta and the logarithm is connected to the ultraviolet divergence and therefore predictable. Once we know the 1 over epsilon pole, we also know the log. In fact, here there is nothing beyond the log like plus 1 or so doesn't appear. Um, but the log would be immediately known once we know the ultraviolet divergence. Now for the hard part, a mu hard. We have just computed it and let us put in the prefactors, then we get y square small m square divided by 8 pi square times the Higgs mass square times a0 of m Higgs square divided by m Higgs to the fourth, uh, sorry, m Higgs square, times uh, these epsilon dependent prefactors, and if you work them out, you get minus one, minus epsilon over six in this case. And uh, then we can multiply. So the A0 is also uh, easily written down, similar to this one. It's not the same, but uh, very similar, uh, plus the 1 over epsilon. So in the end, we get the same prefactor, 8 pi square times the Higgs mass square. And so between this, uh, the m square cancels. This uh, thing is dimensionless. And if we plug in the result, sorry about this, we get minus 1 over epsilon minus ln mu square divided by m Higgs square minus 1 minus 1 over 6. So overall minus 7 over 6. So the difference to here is this additional uh, constant term which in general can always exist but accidentally is 0 here. So again uh, the minus 1 over epsilon is now already predictable from this plus 1 over epsilon and it corresponds to an infrared divergence. This is again connected. And uh, now we see that uh, we have a physical result. The divergence cancels as it should. The ln mu square cancels also as it should but what remains is a physical logarithm of n m Higgs square divided by the muon mass square, which is what we were looking at from the beginning. So to summarize, the UV divergence of the soft part is cancelled by the infrared divergence of the hard part. And this corresponds to the discussion in our section 3, 2, 4, where we discussed this thing with the cut of lambda and added the incorrect terms which added up to zero and that is exactly what happens here. They add up to zero. But 
these ultraviolet and infrared divergences allow to understand the emergence of logarithms. Uh, namely, in one case, we need Ln mu square, which can only be accompanied by the light scale. In the other case, only by the heavy scale. Therefore, there must remain a physical log with a large mass ratio, which is a very important ingredient in the final result. And so, therefore, the full result, A mu full, is then given by the sum. And then let's write down the simple formula in full glory. Y square, M square over 8 pi square. Uh, divided by the Higgs mass square times ln m Higgs square over small m square minus 7 over 6. Okay. That is the result. And here you see this huge logarithmic enhancement of the contribution. Now, did you already look at this question on the exercise sheet? What is the phenomenological impact of all of this? How large are really the numbers which come out of the diagram? Well, in this case, it's 10 to minus 14, I think. Yes. Minus 14. Yes. Compared to what? What is the reference value? Minus yes. Yes. So it is very small. And why is it so small? Yes, so here we have the muon yukawa coupling, which is incredibly small, and therefore the entire diagram is super uh, small and strongly suppressed by this. However, it is nevertheless enhanced by a few orders of magnitude by the large logarithm, but overall, indeed, it is actually negligible. Nevertheless, it's very good to uh, know how we can understand the structure of the contribution by using the method of regions. And other diagrams, uh, with larger Yukawa couplings would have the same behavior. So also in uh, theories beyond the standard model, there appear very frequently diagrams which have exactly this shape with one scalar and one fermion, where the fermion couples to the photon. All these diagrams have this formula as a result in the limit where uh, the scalar is heavy and the fermion is light, because that is just all we used. And then some other diagrams might have here a large coupling constant. For example, if that would be a supersymmetric diagram, could be that this is a smuon, the superpartner to the muon, which is a scalar and heavy. This could be the superpartner uh, to some gauge boson, which is maybe not so heavy. And then this would be a diagram exactly of this form, where the coupling here is much bigger. So that is a relevant result. And so here we have this logarithmic enhancement. Our time is up, but of course you can now visualize what would happen for the set. Namely, no one over epsilon here, no logarithm here, just a finite result. No one over epsilon here, no logarithm here, just a finite result. And then overall in combination, we have just coupling constant times numbers. That's all, no logarithmic enhancement. And that is important because it means that the set contribution is of the order 10 to the minus 9, which is relevant for comparison to experiment. Otherwise, it would be 10 to the minus 7 or 8. That would have been seen already a long time ago. OK, let's summarize that the next time. Uh, maybe you can continue to look at the exercise sheet. By the way, uh, the entire solution is already uploaded on the Selma page, corresponding essentially to the lecture notes with all the details filled in. So you can compare your calculation with this as well. All right, then have a nice day.